Hi, everyone. My name is Olga Mack. I'm the CEO of Parley Pro. I've recently wrote a book about blockchain value, and I have received numerous emails ranging from what are the examples of blockchain value and projects to various legal issues. So very excited today. I have a fantastic guest. Yeah. Uh, so tell us a little bit about yourself and, and the project you're working on. So my name is Daniel Uribe. I am the, or, or in Spanish, Daniel Uribe. I am the CEO and co-founder of Ginobank.io. It's a Californian-based uh, company that aims uh, to promote the use of non-fungible tokens to uh, represent sp specifically biosamples, uh, human biosamples, or, well, any uh, tissue, uh, actually, that could be processed by a laboratory. And then it requires like a permission or a consent or a specific treatment in terms of the bioethics boards or the or or, or any privacy laws. Like for instance, right now we are looking at at uh, at a world where uh, we see cases where European laws are not entirely compatible with uh, America's laws, or vice versa. Right? There are some. Um, inconsistencies there. So the, the idea is to try to facilitate this and uh, the, the technology is, is uh, empowering mostly the donor or the, or the participants in these uh, studies. Really cool. So I, I definitely want to talk about the, the Gina Bank and the blockchain aspects of it and the value it brings. But before we go there, um, would love to hear more about your past because this is not your first rodeo. You've done some yeah. of this before. So for context, so we can better appreciate where you come from and your interest, um, tell us tell us what, what happened in the past. Born and raised in Mexico City. Professionally speaking, I was uh, raised by a very dear company. Uh, I was an employee in Sun Microsystems by, back in 2002. That was my first uh, uh, you know, um, approach with uh, cool technology. My background is in telecommunications and electronic engineering. So back then I was, uh, or I specialized in cybersecurity, specific for Unix systems. Um, uh, we, uh, some, some of you might remember the good Solaris uh, operating system. Then I specialized in, um, in storage area networks back then, the cool thing was to was uh, to connect hard drives using fiber optics and and switches. Right, that that was what what was going on. A little bit um, fast forwarding, I went to Stanford. Uh, well, I studied an MBA. I graduated an MBA in two thousand eleven. Then I went to Stanford to do an executive uh, an executive program. Actually, um, Condoleezza Rice uh, gave us gave us a, a class, very interesting one um, that that I recall. Then I went to Singularity University, and there I met with the blockchain aspect. I remember Peter Diamandis talking about the blockchain and the Bitcoin. It was uh, 2015. Two hundred dollars uh, approximately was the cost of one Bitcoin. And I was fascinated about that technology. Uh, I, I was clearly seeing the, the, the improvement of security or cybersecurity by decentralizing the, the, the services or the, the network. So it was uh, obviously, I, I, was, I, I was coming from uh, technologies that, that servers were the size of a refrigerator. Right, it was three million dollar server, central server, very reliable, but that was like the I believe the the peak of the centralization, right? Where where companies bought these big monsters, and now obviously an Apple M1 uh, laptop has more computing power than those monsters. So obviously the decentralization and and the and, and being a neutral technology, in this case, that not uh, being part of any company makes total sense. And just, uh, again, fast forward, the next uh, thing was in 2017, my son was diagnosed uh, with a rare disease. Uh, he has a mutation in his DNA. And that's where blockchain and genomics entered my life. 
Wow, what a story. Uh, I think you were getting into uh, a Juno Bank and why you found it. Right. Uh, so do, do tell, do tell how that came about. Obviously, I, I was just a, a regular person in terms of knowledge about DNA, right? We saw it in the movies and how, uh, you know, forensics was based on DNA and movies and Gattaca and all these kind of uh, movies. But my life was not uh, close. So two, two things happened. The first one is that I was lucky to have two students, two Mexican students, in, in, as visitors in our home in Palo Alto. And uh, they, were, they were studying genomics, population genomics. So that was also happening. And then the accident of my son, and everything was like in the same year, the same um, kind of, of, uh, of time, right? Window of time. So uh, with these two key things happening, a concept of a cryptographic wallet that could help people to, we call it tokenize. Tokenization is a part of serialization, obviously, as, as you as you, rec you know, I mean, we, we, we've been talking about a little bit in the past. This serialization uh, of the human DNA data for us is the baseline or, or, the, or the foundation of the project. Uh, so we believe that by serializing this data and link and being able to link it to a, cri a cryptographic identity in the context of a public blockchain is where we want to be, right? Is is where you want to register your your data as as uh, let me please uh, call this concept of biological digital property, if I may, but. What I'm trying to tell you is that it, all the concept was there. It was August 2017. And a little bit later in May 2018, we were uh, founding uh, the, the company uh, and filing the, the, the first uh, non provision patents. Yeah. In a nutshell, if you were to describe what problem your company solves, how would you describe it? The problem is the consent, right? Consent today is a very static thing. We think that consent. Uh, changes throughout the time because uh, it's not the same where you are, like, like for instance, our case where you are all worried about your son. So obviously you are in a very vulnerable position psychologically and physically and all, all the aspects. So obviously you will consent the, the whole world to see uh, your genomic data or your son's genomic data or whatsoever, right? But if things change, as uh, usually happens, right? Uh, life is, is very dynamic. These same, same incentives of these same reasons might change as well. So there is a lot of friction with researchers, with people who uh, has custody of this data one, once is uh, processed and stored, where they... There is there is a natural resistance uh, resistance to delete it or to recontact the the donor or the owner because it's expensive is you know is literally you you would have to have a call center right <laughs> just attending all the calls and doubts and paperwork we want to be in the middle we want to be a facilitator where cryptography and decentralization might help to do peer-to-peer -peer permissions to use the data for research in the most seamless way. So again, is the problem is the consent. Consent is a good thing. It dignifies the person. We don't want to incentivize people selling their data or treating their DNA data as merchandise. I confess we started like uh, playing around that idea in the very beginning because we were in the ICOs in 2017 fever. So we were tempted to, you know, issue at ERC20 and say, hey, upload your data here and we will pay you in some kind of a uh, natural token or, or na native token. And actually another company tried that. It was, it was not successful. And so we are focused on the consent. So this is, in a nutshell, a decentralized network 
to exchange cryptographic consents for use of genomic data for research. So, and, and the context in which where you would give that consent is uh, if I am the person and I store my bio sample information uh, for research purposes, or are there any other purposes? There are many purposes. The main one is research. Uh, research like uh, is, is many things, but it's, it can also be for, as we call it, info entertainment, right? Like for instance, your ancestry report. Uh, ancestry reports are cool. They can give you some insights. Like for instance, myself, I didn't know I, I am 12.5% Jew. Um, so I have, I, I have a, a, maybe a grand grandparent um, from, or a grandparent, right? Uh, fr from the, from the um, uh, Jewish uh, heritage. Uh, but I also have, uh, I believe it was 20% of ancestry from Aztecs, right? So I'm a Mexican with European, obviously I'm, I'm, I'm a mix, right? Um, a good, um, but what I'm trying to tell you is that these use cases like nutrigenomics, uh, which is precision food, uh, ancestry are obviously use cases, but we want to mainly focus to increase the liquidity of uh, genomic data for, for research. And if I may add, specifically for Latinos and Latinas and minorities, because we know for, because of the, of the data that 80% or maybe more of the data is only from European ancestry or ethnicities. And there is, there is lack of information uh, for Latinos because it's only 2%. Uh, the other 19% or 18% is, is Asian uh, the data, I mean, combination of Asian ethnicities. But we are we are not present uh, usually in the in research, and where we are um, almost a billion pe people that are from Hispanic uh, ancestry. So so that's that there's there's another opportunity there to to represent uh, the 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 Latino Latina communi uh, community. I love that. That's very important. Uh, Latinos uh, are a, a major force in a, 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 of Earth's population. So should Thank be excluded you. in research for sure. Um, you mentioned two concepts that I would like you to elaborate. One is that of digital property. Um, mm. In the context of, of gene, what do you mean by that? It's a, it's a very tricky concept. I know many lawyers uh, as yourself uh, usually challenge this and I, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm not challenging, I'm no, just, no, no. I actually, you know, I think we're on the same page there. I do, I do want to understand your definition though so whatever any manufacturer has serial numbers unique serial numbers um we can tokenize it we can give that uh, to an identity in the blockchain and then um pairing it with uh, a wallet right uh, which is which means it'll correspond to a private key that will be owned by a human right and that human will be the controller of what's uh, going on with that biosample and the corresponding residual data. That residual data uh, in our context, in our uh, digital scarcity or metaverse kind of concept is, is, is uh, digital property. Because again, let's remember that DNA data is very easy to identify it, right? Usually, a commercial company might extract uh, your your uh, you will genotype your DNA, and will extract like seven hundred thousand SNPs, right, or or letters. But by only having fifty of them, you can uh, fingerprint that data set, which means only by, only by having fifty of them you can differentiate one data set from another one. You don't need the 700,000. So this is how sensitive in terms of re-identification this data is. So what we do is we tokenize 96 SNPs, which is still very privacy preserving. You can say almost nothing or, well, a few things about the person with 96 SNPs. But the cool thing is that by, by making this 96 SNP token, you can identify the rest of them. So it's a tiny but significant data set that will be uh, useful to 
um, yeah, to to identify the the the, the rest, right? Because it's is is your is you, right? So uh, when you talk of, when you in this context of um, of digital property, um, you other concept that you refer to is uh, liquidity of genomic data. Help me understand what you mean by that. Yes, um, the, before the pandemic, right? There, there were two major com- There are two major companies. They they reached um, around twenty seven million people that have used um, their services. I mean, like they have a speed kit and use it to send your their samples and be processed. So today. Uh, so after the pandemic, we, are real- we realized that even 27 million people is very few because we are almost reaching 8 billion people. And ideally, we should have uh, a system or a network to do epidemiologic uh, surveillance, for instance, right? Which, which would, would involve cross-border exchange of biological samples to tackle big problems as a pandemic. So obviously the COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis showed us that not only we are disconnected, we don't have uh, a way to make valid, for instance, um, the bioethic boards to work seamless with the bioethic work, uh, boards of other countries. And we don't have how to involve the donors and how to ask for a consent, like for instance, in different language, and so on and so forth. So th- there is there is a need, uh, or, uh, in my in my opinion, there is a clear need to build a, a, a digital infrastructure for cross border biobanking. That's that's what uh, really this is about, or at least that is the major or the moonshot right here. And by at least ser- serializing the biosamples and linking them to a cryptographic identity, hopefully, is part of the solution. Obviously, we know that we rely also in laws, local laws or uh, continental laws as GDPR. But again, it's, it's, uh, I believe it's, it's going to be part of the, of the alternative. So um, you also just referred to another concept of biobanking. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I want to make sure that everyone comes along on the journey yes. with us. Tell, tell us briefly what do you mean by that? Uh, biobanking is, is the same aspect as a bank, as a financial bank. Uh, is, is, is somewhere that has uh, usually refrigerators that keeps uh, tissues. It could be animal, plants, human, right? There are different sorts of biobanks. And um, usually it's to preserve and to study different uh, aspects, right? Like, to, like, for instance, today we have more COVID-19 biosamples than ever in biobanks around the world. And now they're very important to look for aspects as the various mutations, right? The, as we know, now we are in a, in a, in a Delta kind of, of mutation that is affecting specifically Asians. Uh, Mexico is, already has some cases. But again, these these biobanks uh, becomes very important to um, to have all these historic, uh, you know, uh, samples right from from humans or patients. There's people donating the whole body of their beloved ones once they 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 are not anymore with us um, to to research. So that's that's a complete specimen and all sorts of of uh, research programs. Uh, then, then, then happens. Um, by by the way, a fun fact is that eighty percent of wives uh, are are open to to donate. <laughs> <laughs> we will not comment. And I exactly. will definitely not comment on that as a wife. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and it's just a joke. I mean, it's. it's... Uh, okay, so. Very fascinating, very interesting. I want to maybe talk a little bit about why blockchain. Mm. Why, you know, there, there are other there are plenty of technologies, there are database technologies that have been doing this for a while. Maybe top one or two reasons why blockchain is a useful technology to solve the challenges that you have identified. It's an excellent question, um, a very interesting one. So in first world countries, this, this question is very hard to answer because there are very 
good and reliable alternatives. Like you have top universities, you have top biobanks, you have top uh, programs funded by governments that are really transparent. They have amazing boards of researchers and so on and so forth. So they, they work decent decently or very well right let me go to the developed world or the underdeveloped world where, where it's clearly it's, it's very clear why the need of a blockchain blockchain especially in international cases where you need to interchange uh data is 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 really clear the the added value because for instance, Asian countries might like Amazon or might not like Amazon as a cloud provider because they are American company, right? Or Google. There are some countries that they do not trust Google and they there is even, you know, uh, a firewall and you cannot use Google in some Asian countries. So again, blockchain is neutral, right? It's a neutral uh, network. Strictly talking, there's there 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 has no it, it has no jurisdiction, and that makes spe specifically good for uh, adoption, right? So citizens adopt it because it's it's not uh, governed by any authority or whatsoever. So, but again, in case of the of the developing countries, usually you don't trust governments, you don't trust. Um, What's going on with the with the local biobanks? Because maybe they don't have enough resources. Maybe they, I mean, all all the the, the quality assurance is not there, right? So, at the end of the day, what blockchain in biobanking provides is is the ability to distribute your your bio samples to whatever part of the world where you could find as a donor, as a parent, as uh, you know, even as a, as a researcher, the best facilities without any geographical or theoretically without any geographical um, constraint, because hopefully we will also tokenize the refrigerators, right? And by tokenizing refrigerators will mean that the, the space will be there available to be uh, verified where is your biosample, right? In a decentralized way. Um, so there are many things that could happen in the future by allowing just to to this data to be publicly available. Not not by by saying that is um, uh, you know not not privacy preserving because that's the other aspect. Blockchain allows you to to do privacy preserving, um, te uh, you know, coding and and, and technology. But again, in a, in a large or a very, very, um, uh, how do you say, like in a futuristic, you will have the best researchers. It will not matter where, which country, you will just ship your, your bio sample and they will cryptographically sign the, the custody of it and you'll be able to interact with them support them and they will support you with transparency and uh, acknowledge of ownership and control of your bio data in a decentralized kind of network. So that's, that's literally what we want. So the idea is that, especially in the, in the developing countries, is that you essentially solving the challenge of trust. Um, and then maybe right. secondarily over time, the ability to move that information quickly and freely independent of whether you are in developed or developing country that that, that need is, is is present everywhere and the challenge you identified is that actually the the samples actually physically have to be stored in the refrigerator um, and so tokenizing one and you know and that that in itself because it stays within borders uh, presents a challenge even when the sample is tokenized because the fridge is physically within questionable borders possibly um, very interesting. You mentioned uh, that at some point you considered uh, using ERC-20, and for those listeners who don't know what it is, ERC-20 is, 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 an, is essentially digital currency. Um, you know, it's, you know, you know, you can use it just like money. It's, it's fungible, interchangeable, and uh, tradable, and all of that. And instead, you opted out for NFTs. I don't know, are you guys on the Ethereum? Is that, is that where you're on? So you said, are you using uh, ERC-721? Is that... Is that what the sample is? So instead, you opted for ERC-721. Um, 
help us understand why you made the choice of using ERC721 instead of ERC20. Uh, very good question. So the first one is because by using the ERC20, we would be treating DNA data as a merchandise, and we don't want that, right? We, we don't think DNA data even from animals should be uh, merchandise, but everybody is, you know, uh, that's our opinion. So in 2018, back then, um, the only case that was famous for the NFTs was, was CryptoKitties. And obviously in, in biology- yeah, they're, they're really cute. They have that going yes. <laughs> And And people who know the project, it was, for me, it was very interesting because the the phenotype, right, the the, the expression of the attributes, or they call it the attributes, comes from a 256-bit genome. So a, each cat has its own genomic information, right? That is literally what you you tokenize. You don't tokenize the image of the cat. You tokenize the the, the attributes, right? The 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 genome that. Uh, going through this special algorithm will uh, you know have as a, as a result the image of the cat so you can mate them some of them cannot mate uh, they have because they have a sexual chromosome and so on and so forth so obviously for me it was like well let, let's take this it makes sense to apply it to genomic to human genomic data and that's why uh, where I, I started like uh, you know looking into space and a little bit later, I had the, the privilege to work with William Entriken. William Entriken is the lead author of the ERC721. So he, uh, along with other group of engineers, uh, came with a standard. So they, 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 they literally created the ERC721, which, by the way, was part of the team of the, of the CryptoKitties. And um, the, the special thing about our NFT, or uh, as we call it, the bio-NFT, is that it never transmit ownership. So as you may know, the smart contract has a field that says ownership. In other use cases like collectibles, like uh, crypto art and so on and so forth, so the ownership is transmitted. Not in the biosample uh, world, or at least that's what our vision. It's only a delegation token, it's a permission token. So the, the, the NFTs are used to create a permission or a license to use for certain unspecific things, which is again, like the, the dynamic consent uh, token. But it, it, the, the ownership will always remain with the data subject or the participant of the study. Is there a technical name to, to the bio NFT, like uh, ERC721 or is, it goes by bio NFT? We, we call it a biosample permission token, which is part of the bio NFTs. There are several bio NFTs. Bio NFTs for um, coffee is coming. Uh, bio NFTs for uh, animals, so for for pedigrees are also coming. Uh, so every biological uh, being could uh, potentially will be able to serve them or serve the industry with bio NFTs. Very interesting. Um, and uh, uh, in, in the context of a coffee, what, what is the interest? Of, I understand the reason not to transfer the ownership of, right. of, uh, of your bio, I guess, that, that's so part of who you are, that, that, that that's repugnant that you, you transfer the ownership. Uh, with respect to coffee, uh, wh why is it uh, a bio NFT as opposed to ERC721? It's, it's the same. They are different species, right? Um, there's uh, many aspects of the of the types of, of coffee, just to prove origin, to prove authenticity, and it's literally to differentiate like the premium uh, species from the, the standard ones, right? So this is this is very important for the buyers, and it's very important to respect. Um, the the different uh, types like organic coffee from non-organic coffee and so on, so on and so forth. So this is very important for for the buyers. The same kind of the same with animals. Animals are really the industry. I mean, um, let's say with cows, right? There are different denominations or uh, or species, and then the pedigree 
becomes really important. So you can tokenize through DNA the a certificate where uh, somebody you know is interested on just proving that this specimen is uh, from X or Y Z you know origin. So that's that's another kind of bio NFT. To be clear, in that case, we're not talking about cow the property. We're talking about cow the bio sample. Exactly. Um, yes, or well, at least the the provenance, right? There's the, the the pedigree where you or or high in horses as well, right? This is the same thing. Um, also, you can you can there's there's a lot of value on proving uh, the the pedigree of of the animals, right? Really cool. Uh, very interesting discussion, and I, uh, I I definitely learned something around bio NFTs and how they are different from ERC seven twenty ones. And and for the record, Crypto Kitties have been ERC seven twenty one, and I like that you clarified that it was all about the actually uh, the genes and 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 breeding of the cat, and it's not about the picture. That is one thing that people. Right. Uh, I usually don't understand is that when they buy a crypto kitty, they do not buy a picture. They buy data that comes along with a license to a picture, a very generous license to a picture, but that's that's what they're buying. Um, very fascinating conversation. And I guess uh, to conclude our conversation, would love for you to sort of think about and, and maybe share with us, what do you think uh, is the future of uh, uh, of bio NFTs? So we we like this idea. So we are we are uh, also partnering with this <laughs> company. This is called Abado. It's a cryptographic service. This is a, a special one. Uh, usually, the, these are are um, used to uh, to mine. I mean, it's just to build a Bitcoin node. But we we are going to we are designing uh, for to have a genome a family genome box. In research, um, all the all the family ideally information is required or very useful to detect the mutations and uh, and this eventually will be able, you will be able to inherit it. The, how does it, the the future looks is if you have let's say my data or maybe my parents' data and it's useful for my kid that eventually will have his own. Uh, uh, children, right? It'll be super easy, or well, it will be more easy to diagnose something if, even from inception, right? Even if, as an embryo, you will have all the the descend the uh, ascendant um, information, right? So, and I believe family is the correct instance or the in, the correct. Uh, uh, you know, uh, society kind of cell that uh, is is uh, better suited to keep this information, uh, uh, or or is is the best uh, gatekeeper. Let's call it. So so, does, so does this box belong to a person or to a family? So yeah. So the all, all the mutations are in the, in our pedigree let's call it or that way i mean obviously pedigree is more used to to our, our ancestry right but what i'm trying to tell you is that the idea here is to create a, 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 a let's say a, a private family server to store your genomic information and then just control it using these nfts of access to to researchers and it, it'll be like the the original copy, right, or the original source of information. And um, that that is that is somewhere in between what we believe it's going to happen in the future. Again, three reasons. The first one is these little boxes are getting really really powerful. So you you can have a very powerful server in your house with no cooling or special kind of you know, technology to preserve the, the servers, server working. The internet that you have in your home right now is really good. It improved a lot with the pandemic. I mean, that's like kind of the collateral beauties of, if I may. And then the, the rest is like, uh, in this way, it'll, you avoid the centralization of the data, which is always a honeypot for hackers, right? So uh, I don't think in the future, I don't see a cloud centralizing 1 billion 
human genomes. I don't see that. There's many, there are many researchers saying, no, is that it will be ideal to have a central cloud with a billion DNA samples from humans. Personally, I don't think that's never going to happen. If it's going to happen, it's a billion wallets controlling a billion uh, individual, individualized um, data, secure data rooms, as we call them, that somehow are interacting in, in context, but, but not like just aggregating data and just uh, make it available for, for everybody. I don't think that's going to happen. So I don't know if that makes sense to you. Okay, I um, I, I love uh, very I, I love this concept. I'm not um, I I'd love to learn more about it. Sounds very interesting that all of us will come at least attached to some sort of box with that has a full disclosure on Olga. Um, jokes aside, it, it is obviously very helpful to to have a secure information about all my ancestors and um, and and various genetic information to see, to see what the various predispositions. Obviously, for reasons you just described, uh, it's a dangerous thing to centralize uh, and if it falls in the wrong hands. Then thank you so much for joining and, and sharing your experiences and wisdom.